Lord Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this week. And uh, Lord, just, just the blessings that you continue to pour out on us, Lord. And thank you for everybody here tonight that wants to learn more about who you are and, and how you want us to live. And so, Father, I just thank you for tonight. I ask you this, the Holy Spirit, we have an encounter with you like we always do, Lord. But just a powerful encounter with you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, what is tr why is truth so important? How does a Christian go throughout their life without understanding what truth is or why even truth is in the world or um, anything like that? How can, a, how can, a, how can someone who goes to church and, and, and think they have this understanding of the Bible but really doesn't have the importance of truth? They're missing something, aren't they? They've got, the, they've got the, the general view of, of all the whole Bible, but the, and until you take and put these words together in place, you're missing something out of your life. And until you understand that, that every word of God is truth, and not just understand it, but you live by it, you believe it, uh, then this foundation starts to be put in place one stone at a time. Without truth, there's no sense even going to the next stone. There's no sense even, uh, there's just no reason to go there because you'll fail at every other stone because you don't, haven't believed the truth. If some reason you're failing in one of these other areas in, in your life, it's, it usually will go back to truth. There's something about God's word, truth, that you just haven't sunk into your life yet. Next question is, uh, what will you do now that you know truth? What, what, how does it, knowing what we've talked about, how does that affect your life? Or how does it apply to your life? And, or how should it apply to your life? The way you look at scripture, the way you look at the circumstances in your life. Now I was thinking about the fact that truth brings clarity um, because lies bring fear, like fake fear, not the good kind of fear like the fear of God, but fake fear, apprehension, anxiety, and uh, because we live out the lies that we believe so if you believe a lie, then it leads you into uh, like, uh, uh, like the abyss. But the truth gives you clarity, boldness. The Bible said that the righteous are bold as a lion. It gives you boldness, gives you hope, and, uh, and it gives you clarity. You, you have a clear vision of what you're supposed to be doing because you are acting uh, based on what's really real, what's like uh, John said, and what's really true. Uh, what is Satan's main thing? Lies, deceit, manipulation. That's how he controls the world. That's how he does temptation. That's what he does everything. So the, the whole time we're living throughout, what we're doing, we're always being bombarded with, in the, in the political world they, would call it, world, they would call it spin. They're always spinning something to try to make it look better or, or, or to make them sound good or whatever. That's what Satan does. He's always spinning something. He spun the truth in the Garden of Eden. He's always spinning the truth that we will look at it in a different way than what God has told us to look at it. So we, it's so important to know truth because it is the Word of God. He did come down here to bring us truth. And it's the only truth that we, we must live by. We must live by that truth. Uh, without it... We're going to fail. We're going to fall in the temptations. We're going to believe manipulations. We're not even going to be able to separate these things in our mind. So truth is really, really, really important. How can knowing truth change your mindset and add to your faith? One of the greatest things I remember years ago was when I, I was like a lot of other people. I, learned, I thought Jesus came to do certain things and he absolutely did. But when I, the, the, the day I remember reading the scripture, heard about Jesus came to bring truth, it just completely changed my mindset. Because I realized then that even though I really kind of knew it, but I, this just, it just sank home with me that without him, there is no truth. Because he is the truth. And so all these other things that he's accomplished and he's still accomplishing is part of because he is the truth. And without the truth, none of these other things could, could be established. They couldn't happen. I mean, what do you know, how do you know really what salvation is if you don't believe the truth of what he says? So if we believe the truth of salvation and what it's about, then we must believe the truth of everything else because everything he says is truth or nothing is truth. Nothing matters. And so I remember the, the, the moment I, that that hit me right smack in the heart. It's like, wow, that was just profound. And then I started applying that to everything in my life. And it just started to change how my reality was, how everything was. Because Jesus is truth. And so I hope, it, hopefully that, that had an eye opener for some of you. So as we start tonight, I want to start in Deuteronomy 32, 1 through 3. And just kind of open this up a little bit. And it says, give ear. Everybody say give ear. 
And this is, uh, this is God. And Moses is getting ready to just give this beautiful prayer. And he's ready to talk to his people right before they go over to the promised land. And he says, give ear, O heavens. And he's just not talking to his people. He says, O heavens, and I will speak. And then it says, hear. So he's talking not just to, he's talking to the whole universe, the whole creation. He's talking to everything. Because he's omnipotent God. I mean, he's, he's the God of everything. Amen? And so he's, he's opening this up and he says, Give ear. In other words, open both the ear. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak and hear. O earth, the words of my mouth. So he's telling you, everything I'm going to tell you is true. Everything that I've given Moses and I'm going to give to Joshua, it's true. And they're, they're, you need to abide by what's going on. It's truth. Now remember, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. The Pentateuch, as the, as the Jewish nation would call it. Moses wrote these books this time frame. He had all his notes, all his things from, from Abraham on up to Joseph. And he compiled all of that with all the other Israelites for the 400 years they were in captivity. And he wrote this Bible. It was from God to Moses. And we know Moses talked with God. He was up on a mountain one time for over 40 days talking with God. So Moses was a, a man so involved with God, so close to God. Maybe no one on the face of the earth has been as close to God as Moses. And he writes this down and he just, he understands who God is. And he's wanting to tell his people, Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain. In other words, what he teaches you is, that I'm going to teach you this truth. I'm going to teach you all these words. They need to drop like, like this rain. That it just hits everything, everybody, everywhere, every place. That's what rain does. It comes down and just saturates it. And that's what the Word of God is supposed to do. It comes down and just saturates our heart and our mind with the truth of God. And when you read the Bible, if you start to feel like, well, I'm not sure that sounds like a fable. I'm not sure that's, that's really true. You need to go back and check your heart. You need to get in some deep prayer with God. Because it's going to be hard to read the Bible, hard to understand the Bible if you're questioning it all the time. And many people question it. Questioning is okay, but if you're questioning the truth, if, you're, if your mind's not believing the truth of what the Word says, I question it because I don't understand sometimes. But I still believe it. Amen? Just because I understand it doesn't make it truth. That's the height of arrogance. Let my teachings drop as the rain, my speech distill. In other words, it's gentle gentle rain as the dew as raindrops on the tender herb and that's what he's trying to draw you a picture of how he wants this truth brought down to you not something pounding on you or thunderstorms but he wants it brought down like this now if you if you can't abide by the truth and things are all going haywire in your life maybe you need a few thunderstorms in your life to figure things out maybe God needs to get your attention but that's not the way he wants to do it he wants to bring in the gentleness to us we cause the issues do we or do we not? We do. I cause the issues in my life. It's not God. He's just trying to grab hold of me because he loves me. And he loves you so much that he wants you to get this word. Truth. As raindrops on the tender herb. You notice he says tender herb. And as showers on the grass. For I proclaim the name of the Lord. Ascribe greatness to our God. That's the truth there. He wants you to ascribe greatness to our God. He's giving you this beautiful prayer. As we saturate our minds with God's truth, we will be challenged to leave our own truth behind. Now when I wrote that, I'm thinking, you know, because so many people have their own truths. Am I right or wrong? Well, some of you, many, maybe not now, but maybe, maybe some of you now, maybe some of you in the past, you had a, a question, or not mainly a question, just you really struggled to believe if Jonah was swallowed by a big fish. But some of these history lessons in the Bible, how can they be really true? And so maybe some people question that. They say, well, there's no way. Or God didn't write that. Man wrote that. That's one thing I hear all the time. You're absolutely right. God did, uh, man did write that through God, through the Holy Spirit. The same way we still preach and teach today. So as we saturate our minds with God's truth, we will be challenged to leave our own truth behind. Two plus two is what? <laughs> Is 2 plus 2, 5? Is it 3? It's always 4. It can't change, right? It's an absolute truth, right? The same with God's Word. You have to have it in your mind 
that way. Along with God's, along with those God has divinely appointed to teach. Everybody say divinely appointed to teach. God has divinely appointed to teach and lead us into what? Truth. I, without a shadow of a doubt, I believe God divinely opened my heart to the wilderness way. And it took many weeks to, to, for that to open. But I, I believe he divinely did it. There was no other reason for it. Such as every, any series or any sermon I, I do. It's it, it, the outsider right now. I believe he divinely opened my heart to that. I'm still trying to figure it out. I don't need to figure it all out. I just need to know what this Sunday's going to be. And he'll continue to help me figure that out. We learn to walk in truth. Our journey will require all three. It's going to require teach, lead, and us in, and walk in truth. That's the three things it's going to require. Teach, lead, and walk in truth. You come here and you, you allow me to, 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 to speak to you. You allow me to preach to you. You allow me to teach you. You allow others in the church, Bill, and others uh, in the church to teach you and, to, and to, to be with you and to love you and to just hold us, each other accountable. And that's what God requires of us because we know the truth. At least what God is allowing me to know right now. There's more truth that I'm going to unfold as I live my life. Isn't that a beautiful thing how God does that? He unfolds more truth to you. He, he changes, and not changes, but he changes your mindset and your direction. He shows you more truth. And then we know if we're living by it or not. In Galatians 5, 16, it says, I say then, walk in the Spirit. Of course, the Spirit is truth. And that's what we're talking about, walking in truth right now. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How do we not fulfill the lust of the flesh? Walk in the Spirit, man. Walk in the truth. So when the lust of the flesh starts to come around your life, what's missing in your life? Man, this is not rocket science. What's missing in your life? Walking in the Spirit. That's, that's, not, that's nothing difficult except we make it difficult. Oh man, I can't believe all these things are piling up on me. Well, quit paying attention to it. Paying attention to God. Walk in the Spirit. Learn what God's trying to teach you through this instead of always becoming the victim of it. So I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill, everybody say fulfill, the lust of the flesh. In Ephesians 5.8 it says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So what? We were once darkness, but now we are what? Light. Why are we light? We're learning the truth. We accepted it in within our life. So the darkness is fading away from our life. And the more light we get, the more darkness leaves us. Amen? I notice when I'm studying a lot, I'll have one little light on and my eyes are getting bad. And, and so I have to take that light and turn it right on the pages. And the more I turn it to the pages of God's Word, the more it lights up. You get, you get me there? So the more I, I turn my life to God, the more it lights up in my life. I think I'm going to have to get a brighter light. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 1 John 2, 6, it reads, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to what? Walk. Just as he walked. Notice here, John didn't, isn't leaving any room for error here, he says. In him himself also to walk just as he walked. Capital H, deity, Jesus Christ. So we're to walk as Jesus walked. And you say, I can't do that. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. He walked in truth. And what did he bring us? Truth. That we can walk in the spirit in that truth. Amen? Now, I'm still going to have incidents in my life. Things I, I shouldn't have done. And things I'm going to listen to I shouldn't listen to. And be persuaded in some times. Not persuaded in other times. And I understand that. And I'll get that out of my life as fast as I know it's in my life. So I'm to walk in truth. I, I'm not perfect like Jesus Christ. We won't be until, we're, until we die and go to heaven. Then we're without sin. But until that time, I can walk in his spirit because I know when wrong comes into my life. Amen? Psalms 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp, everybody say lamp, to my feet and a light to my path. In other words, I've got, I, I, when I put on the truth of God and I'm walking in the spirit, I've got big bright lights out in front of me 
and I, it clears the path. I don't have to wear anything. It says here, it's a lamp to my feet. So the right, I can walk where God tells me to walk. Amen? It's a light to my path. And the path is that life we're in, that journey we're on. No matter our age, no matter where we came from, no matter what language we speak, it's the light. We need to never fear the plans God has for those who love him. And I think sometimes that can be a, an issue with some people. But I'm going to go back to the, uh, talking about opening up the church, the crossing. It says, with fresh paint on the walls and pink pews is what was in this church when I walked in here that didn't fit in this church. Pink pews replaced with chairs. Opening Sunday arrived and suitcases of every, of every size were piled near the door. It was the first Sunday and all of them, and all, every suitcase was about our baggage and every suitcase had a sin on it. And we, we, was, we was telling people to, to leave all that outdoors. You remember that? It was suitcase after suitcase piled up. Because new, we, first, day, first Sunday morning, we wanted to make an impact. And so we, and of course I'm a prop preacher. So we lined up the whole front of the church there with suitcases with different, different things on them. And it was reminding people to come through the door, they're looking at that and there's the baggage. Is, baggage. You don't need to bring it in here. This is the church where we, we, we're going to show you freedom in Christ. We're going to preach you to the truth and show you this freedom that God wants you to have. I'm not going to control you. I'm not going to manipulate you. I'm not going to micromanage, but show you freedom. Allow you to make mistakes. Allow the church to make mistakes and hold each other accountable. So that was the, when we opened the doors that morning. On, sign, uh, on the sign out front, you go back here. It was Lego, it was, these packages were Lego legalism, fear, addiction, and so on. On the sign out front, invited the count to join us as we embarked on our journey. And so having done all we knew to do, we waited. Not sure if anyone outside of our tiny little group would come. That's the honest truth. I will never forget the surreal feeling of what happened this, that morning. Folks just kept coming in. Sean Jessica, you remember that? They just kept coming in that morning. Through the doors until worship with over 100 people, mostly strangers, while the church started with a, a borrowed worship leader. Through nothing but prayer. By the second Sunday, the crossing had our own worship team. The crossing went on to have baptism 68 months in a row. And the altar has never once, once stood empty since opening Sunday. In, verse, in Jeremiah 29, 11, of course, a beautiful verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. Wasn't that a beautiful gift as you open up the doors for the first time almost 12 years ago? And when people come in and they see this baggage and, they, and all these things that they're to leave behind. I don't care what about your addiction. I don't care about any of that stuff today. I want to teach you who Jesus Christ was so you can leave it behind. Amen? I know people are coming in this church with all kinds of issues. That's fine. So did I. Your issues are different than mine. No big deal. We're all the same. Amen? And we need to keep remembering and reminding ourselves of that. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to associate with that there person or that there person over there. Well, that, that's, that's just absolutely a terrible mindset. Maybe they don't want to associate with you. Arrogant? That is not the church that Christ died for, is it? And that's not the church I ever envisioned there. God gave me this vision for this church. is to always preach a high view of God. And we look to Him. And I don't even see who you are or where you came from. I try my best not to. But I try to see where God wants to take you. Amen? I know what you say and tell me when you come in. But I also know who God is. I know where He can take us. Amen? And that's the important part. Today's today. Tomorrow's tomorrow. I want to see what you're going to do tomorrow. Let's get rid of that baggage. And that's what we was trying to do. Let it go. Satan knows that. And Satan lies. He lies against the truth. And he'll always just try, try to destroy the church. Just try to destroy, destroy somebody in the church. Always. It's not going away. It's always going to be around. We not, need not fear the plans God has for those who love him. Everybody say, for those who love him. You know, a lot of people... A lot of verses when it talks about those who love God. And Romans 8, 28 is one of them. And, and it's, they fail to mention the part or understand the part of those who love him. See, we have to love him. Amen? 
And if I don't understand who Jesus Christ is, I don't understand that he brought truth to my earth, to this earth and brought truth within my life, then I, I, I don't understand him. I don't know him yet. Amen? I got to know him. I want to have that relationship with him as far beyond any other relationship I could ever possibly have. We need never fear the plans God has for those who love him because he has the best plans for you. Amen? When I see different types of characters come through the door, I only have one thing. God has the best for you. If I have to do discipline on anybody and everybody, if I have to take you down a road that I know I don't even want to go down with you, I'm going to go down there anyway. And some of you know that. I've been down that road with you. But I'm going to tell you the truth and I'm going to discipline you through God's word as we go. Amen? Because that is what true love is. That is what true love is. Because I don't, I don't want you being hurt. We somehow in the church have, have, have forgotten what true love is. And we'll talk about that as the fourth stone. If you go, you go. If you stay, you stay. But you'll get the truth. Truth is the character of Jesus Christ manifested to us through the Holy Spirit. Everybody agree with that? Everybody yell out amen if you agree with that. Amen. So truth is the character of Jesus Christ manifested, manifested to us through the Holy Spirit. So that we can understand the importance of accepting His truth alone. Then and only then can we walk through this life as believers. Separating, separating His absolute truth from the world's lies. Which belong to Satan. If I don't know the truth, if I don't accept the truth, then I'll continue to accept the lie. So if I, if I just said, what's one real important thing about truth? So you don't accept the lies. So you don't fall for the lies. So you don't fall for the temptations that this world will continue to pour out on you. That's how important truth is. Are you ready to embrace the plans God has for you? Are you? Because truth is just the first stone. Are you ready in place to, to, <clears throat> to embrace the plans God has for you? When God asked me to establish the crossing, I never needed to understand what God was going to do by faith and believing in His, His truth. I knew what He could do. And that was enough. Amy? Amen? Jesus is enough. I know Mel likes that. G I give you stickers to you several times. Jesus is enough. That's exactly what I'm telling you about. Jesus is enough. He knew. I didn't need to know. It wasn't my time to know, but He knew. In Colossians 3, 1-3 it reads, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. If then you were raised... Let me think. If then. Big powerful words. Because if, see, if you wasn't raised with Christ, if you wasn't saved, then none of this matters. It doesn't make any sense to you. And you'll always go back to the lie because the lie is easier than the truth. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. What's above? God's truth. Eh? Everything he brings down to us. Seek those things are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Verse 2, it says, set your mind on things above. Everybody say, set your mind on things. Is that truth or is that just a, a statement that we can take or leave? See, set your mind on things above. It's a, it's a commandment. We know we need to do that. Not on things on the earth. And those are the two things that Satan will play with more a lot in your life. He just loves to play with that. Because the things of the earth, the things that we enjoy, are the things that are so hard to separate from. We hear in this verse, that set your mind on things above. It means in everything we have, we set our minds on God. Not on the things of the earth. For you died. Everybody say, for you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. For you died. And we're going to talk about death as we go through here these words. But you died. It's not a physical death. It's this, it's this flesh that we live in. That we surrendered that. That we put our hands up. Why do, why do they put hands up like this? It's because you're defenseless. I can't do anything with my hands. I have no offense. If I put my hands up. It, it's surrender. I surrendered. And I died to myself. And I came alive with Christ. Amen? And those that come to Jesus... And you've surrendered and you've held your hands up and you keep holding them up. And you've died for Christ. Then you are trying to live by the word of God and the truth of God. But the minute you start putting these hands down and you start enjoying the world. You need to understand, did you really die for Christ? Or was that just for the moment and for the feeling and the emotion at the time? 
Because see, a true person of God doesn't leave God. We may step back, we may backslide, we may do a few things, but we always believe the truth and we're always coming back. Amen? We all have things in our lives where we weren't proud of. What bothers me the most is so quickly how people leave. They have set their mind on the earth instead of the things above. Verse 3, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. For I died to myself. My life is now hidden with Christ in God. And I got a wonderful Savior that just probably ought to remind ourselves of that a little more often. Dig deeper. We'll go through these verses here. 2 Timothy 3, 8 and 9, it says, Now as Janice and Jembris, these are people that, that, that did very evil, and I don't have time to go through all that, did very evil in Moses' time, resisted Moses, so, though, so do those, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds. So it says, so do these who resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds. Do you know any men or women of corrupt minds? Absolutely. And what's a corrupt mind? Thinking outside of the Word of God. It has to be, it has, it has to be something filthy. It's, it's just thinking outside of the Word of God. Living outside of the Word of God. Their minds are corrupt by the world. There's certain people that come on and, or I hear on the radio or I read something. And, I, and, I, and one of the guys, was that guy when Will Trevor died a few well, years ago? Uh, Hawkins? Well, supposed to be one of the smartest men that ever lived, right? I could care less about what he knows. He knows nothing because he was an atheist. He has nothing for me. Everything he, he has is corrupt. I don't listen to him. I have no reason to listen to him because he has no understanding of who God is or the Word of God. He's got a corrupt mind. It doesn't matter how everybody else looks at him, how smart he is, or how much mathematics he knows, or whatever else he knows, because he doesn't have the Word of God and he's not in heaven. He said, well, that's pretty harsh. He, well, there's plenty of good men that are really wisdom and really got really good understanding that I can listen to besides that guy. Amen? Why well, you choose to listen to somebody that doesn't know God or doesn't even love God or doesn't, it just ignores God, hates God. What do you listen to somebody like that for? What's he got for you? So I look at these people, these politicians, whoever it might be, and they start to speak. I say, I don't need to listen to them. I don't, it's lies and deceit. I don't need to listen to any part of that. I, I don't care. I don't need to listen to it. It's not going to encourage me. It's not going to lift me up. It's going to start to destroy truth. It's corrupt minds. No, I didn't say that. Paul said that. He wrote it down here for 2 Timothy. Is Timothy's a mentor. Paul's a mentor to Timothy. Resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds. Disapprove concerning the faith. Disapprove concerning the faith. I got all kinds of places I go with that one. This week. There's a lot of I don't care whether it's the Pope or whoever it is, it doesn't matter. Whoever what original believer you want to turn your life to. If they disapprove concerning the faith, they're not of God. They're not of God. Amen? I don't care what the world says about it. The world is corrupt and full of lies. I don't care. They're not of God. If they're not preaching truth, speaking truth, living truth, then they're not of God. Verse 9, but they will... Progress no further, for their folly will be manifested to all as there also was. In other words, when they die, they got no place to go but hell. We're so blessed. You're so blessed to know the truth. You're, you're, in today's world, but you're such a small percentage of the world. You're blessed, and you're only here because Jesus Christ called you here. Amen. You didn't come here on your own will or your own free will. You think you did, but God put it within your heart to come. I tell people many times, many times I've told people, if it wasn't for God putting it in my heart, I wouldn't care one thing about you. I would go off and live my life because that's what self-centered people do. They go off and they live their life. Not caring except for maybe this or this. Not caring about the spiritual needs for others. They just live life. Trying to enjoy everything they can before they die. 
But because Christ is in my life and in your life, we love each other and we care about each other. And we want to help each other. Amen. And so we spend the time working and teaching people. And sometimes the best things you can do is keep quiet and just live your life so others can see. Amen. Speak when necessary. But they will progress no further for their folly will be manifested to all. In 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, I charge you therefore, brother, before I charge you therefore before God that the Lord Jesus Christ, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead. Who's going to judge us? He's going to judge us. Living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach. Everybody say preach. And you don't have to be called to be a pastor, an evangelist, or a preacher to preach. You preach because you know the Word of God and you give it out. Amen? All of us are called to the Great Commission. All of us are called to give out the gospel of Jesus Christ. Preach the Word. Be ready. Everybody say, be ready. In season and out of season. Be ready. Be ready. Every moment of your life, be ready because somebody needs to hear the Word of Truth. Amen? They need to hear it and they need to know you can speak it. But until you know it, you can't speak it. But one of the things we learned in BSF, one of the first things I remember they taught me in BSF and leadership was you can't teach anybody what you don't know. You know, that sunk in my, in my heart and my mind. And I thought, man, that is, that is so profound to me. I can't teach you what I don't know. And anything else would be what? My speculation? Folly? I can only teach what I know. So how and why is it so important to have a foundation? Because I can't teach it if I don't have it and I don't know it. Amen? So this charge he's giving you, I mean, he is, this is, this is something that's important. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Be ready all the time to preach the Word of God. Once you put these 12 words in your life, the whole Bible will open up to you. You'll start to see truth everywhere. You'll start to see the importance of obedience. All of you. will see God's glory more than you could ever imagine. Be ready in season and out in season. Convince. Everybody say convince. Rebuke. That's a tough one for people. But if you know the truth and it's a plan in your heart, you can say, well, excuse me. I think the Word of God says this. Like you'll hear a lot of times, well, that money, that money is just the root of all evil. No, it's not. Well, there's a lot of things people say that's in the Bible that's not in the Bible. It's not, money's not the root of all evil. My goodness, Solomon was the richest man in the world. A lot of these disciples, money's not the, it's the love. Everybody say the love of money. So it just changed everything, didn't it? It just changed the whole perspective on money. It's the love of money. Rebuke, exhort, encourage, in other words, with all long suffering. Everybody say long suffering. Ooh, that is a tough one. With all long suffering. I think Paul had a lot of long suffering within his life. He was telling his young son Timothy, not his son, but he like a son to him, with all long suffering and teaching. So he puts these big convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. He puts all these together. Then verse 3 it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Now, a lot of us hear that all the time. We've prepeated because why? It's the, everybody say the truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. Now, I, I, I wasn't around in the 1800s. The way we live today has never been any way in my lifetime. And I don't think the 1800s and the 1700s, they were more God-centered back then. Some of them may have been way off, but they were more God-centered back then than we are today. See, the world is not God-centered, is it? It's not god it, it needs to be God-centered. And the church must be God-centered. And when the church is not God-centered, when the church can't explain truth, or when the church can't even be obedient, where in the world would the world be? The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Now, let me get this right now, because I don't think the world endures sound doctrine anyway. 
This is a letter going out to the church. Now we got a lot of churches that aren't preaching sound doctrine, don't we? They're full to the brim. And people go to church to be blessed, as I heard the other day. Forget about service. Forget about brotherly love. Forget about coming together as one in Christ. Forget about the altar. Forget about anything like that. Just give me a few words to make me feel good and let me walk out the door and bless me, bless me, bless me. Lives of Satan infiltrating the church. Why is the foundation so important? Because you'll fall for the lives of Satan. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Everybody say endure. It's an important word. And I go back and I think, well, why did Paul write endure? Because endure means you, you continually take it in. You, you listen. You guys got to come here. You come here and you listen to me. And I, I preach on truth for three hours. You're enduring me. You come and you listen to me on Sundays and, and I scream and yell at you. You're enduring me. Amen. You're, you got it. But see, they, they won't. They'll come in and say, that guy's crazy. Then people aren't right. They kind of like each other. I'd rather just come in, get my blessing, and walk out. I don't need anybody else. That's the, that's the big church of the day in most places. Not all of them. Some of them are doing wonderful jobs. And the reason I know that is because I know people that go to some of these churches and they and I say, what are you doing in the church? Some of it's my own family. What are you doing in that church? Well, I, I go on Sundays. Yeah. What else? Well, I go in, I sit down, I get up and I leave. I don't see that anywhere in God's Word. And you know what? It scares me for them. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own, everybody say own desires. Because they have itchy ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers. You know, most churches do not have altar calls anymore. Way, more, I don't know what the percentage is, but most churches do not have altar calls anymore, or if they ever did. When we opened up this church, I felt it deep in my heart that the Lord asked me to do communion every Sunday. And we did. And people would ask me this. And I said, you know, I'd just give them some kind of, I really didn't understand why. This is what, what God, I believe God told me to do. I know it's not what you have to do. Uh, we're supposed to give you communion. Well, I didn't, didn't really say in the Bible. Except every time you come together. I'm not sure that, I, anyway. So I said, well, I don't know yet really. But when God wants me to know, we'll do it. I'll understand it and I'll figure it out. But we've quit doing that every, every Sunday because of COVID. But we should get back to it pretty soon. Maybe the beginning of the year. So it, it took many years for me to understand. And every Sunday, the first Sunday, the altar was full. Every, you know, those people always have this altar. Do you know that? Have you ever noticed that? And some weeks are just piled out here. You don't see that in other churches. You don't see that in other churches. I, I've been to churches on Sunday mornings outside of this. I've been preaching to other churches on Sunday mornings. They, they don't come to the altar. You know what? We, we have failed in some of these places. These, some of these, we have failed to teach, teach people the importance of kneeling before God. See, that brings God glory. Amen? Because you have, you have surrendered yourself. You've given up yourself. And you've come. And it doesn't matter what other people think. You're not embarrassed because of what other people think. You're over here. You're doing business with God. Amen? And what I got from the Lord and years later was that I want to teach them to come to my altar. And I know some of them come because of the communion that week. But I want to teach them to come to the altar. Amen? That's what it was about. It was about teaching people to be comfortable with coming up here and bowing before the Lord and giving their heart, praying out whatever is coming in in their life that they've got to go through this week that's coming up and you're going to need all the help you can get. Amen? It's about giving glory to God. Same thing as baptism. You're giving glory to God. Everything's about giving glory to God. And you better get that in your mind. Now, itchy ears and this doctrine that's not sound and things like that, they don't want to embarrass you. They don't want you to get out of your comfort zone. You just come back to my office here in a little while. Some of you are making something back. You won't, some of you won't, but whatever. 
You come up here and you mean business with God, you're going to my office. I promise you that, but you came up here first. Amen? And if you're not willing to bow before the Lord in His church, what's the point? Yeah. Work it out with God at the altar. Man, it's important. But according to their own desires, because they have itchy ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Teachers that don't want to embarrass them or don't want them to get out of their comfort zone. And they will turn their ears away from the what? Truth. And they will turn their ears away from the truth. Once your ear gets turned away from this, anything's fair game. And be turned aside to what? Fables. Turned aside to fables. The world is left without truth. But you be watchful in all things. Everybody say watchful in all things. How many, how many things? Oh. All things. God's got people everywhere giving out truth. He's got people everywhere giving out truth. All things. He's got people giving out truth. Amen. I give out truth in, in, in the circumstances I'm in. Doors. In the church. Amen. Jesus is the door and I love the door. That's where I give out my truth. Over and over and over again on the job sites, I will give out truth. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. Preach the gospel. Amen? Preach the gospel. Fulfill your ministry. The calling God's given you. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who what? Who what? And that, let's look at the second first Corinthians. Paul's right in his skin. But it, as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Amen. Man, what a future we got. And when I die, I got a better future. I'm heading home. Amen. My future is good. Sure. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Everybody say through his spirit. Sure. For the spirit searches all things. Everybody say all things. all things. Yes, the deep things of God. And that's what we're trying to accomplish here. The deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Amen. Everybody say freely. Man, what a gift he's given us. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. Amen? That's why I don't care what Tim who or this who or that who, I don't care what they say. If they're not of God, they have nothing for me. Not in words which men's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things which spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him. And you should see that all over the world. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They cannot know them. Verse 15, it says, But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. Everybody say, I have the mind of Christ. You do. You do. That's a truth right there. He says, I got the mind of Christ. Because Christ lives within me. The Holy Spirit, the Trinity lives within me. I have that mindset. It's, it's being embedded in me with each word, but I have to learn it. Amen? Salvation is the very first part of it. You're a little baby just being born. Somebody needs to hold that bottle in your mouth. Somebody needs to burp you. Somebody needs to change your diapers. And that is called the church. We lift people up over and over again. It never should stop. 
Romans 8, 6 to 14, then we're going to have to close up here. For, for to be carnally minded is death. Everybody say carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Everybody say life and peace. Spiritually minded, life and peace. If you don't have peace in your life, it says you should. So we got to go back and find out why you don't have peace in your life. Not counting grief and sorrow. God's given us a way to have grief and sorrow when people die. I'm talking about peace, which comes from Jesus Christ and Him alone. There's something wrong with your foundation if you don't have peace. There's something wrong. You're not believing these truths. He says right here, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's the truth. Amen. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is an enemy against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed, this me, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Big, big truth and question there. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Is this some kind of, I don't know, mathematics you can't understand? Is it some kind of college word you can't understand? And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Amen. That's a truth for you. That's a truth for you. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, this question has continued to be poured out by Paul, dwells in you, he would raise, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Spiritual life. And 12 it says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will what? Live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the what? That's the church. There she stood. And this is Vicky wrote this many, many years ago. I think right before we opened the church up. There she stood on the platform at the depot with the baggage accumulating over her life piled all around her. These suitcases just full of things. She carefully kept the prettier bags out front for the world to see. That was easy, for she had grown used to keeping them there. Those bags contained all the things that made her good. Things like good works and kindness. The ugly bags filled with sin, she kept carefully tucked into the back of the pile hidden from the world. That is where the Lord found her and accepted her baggage and all. And so the journey began. If she would have had a clue how far the train would carry her, who could say what she'd have chosen to do? The first thing she noticed on her journey was that others weren't quite as comfortable with their bride as she was. She watched amazed at depot after depot. They labored and struggled with their own baggage. She didn't know what was in, the case, in their cases, but each time the porter asked them to leave a case behind, they would cling to the case and state, I can't, I need this. Still from time to time as they departed the station, she would notice a long bag, uh, a lone bag sitting on the platform, totally abandoned. It was never hard to identify who it belonged to. For settled in their seat, they either had certainty or they would anxiously glance back at the bag. Either way, the train never went back, for the cost would have been far too high. And then one day, the oldest, the oldest thing the oddest thing started happening. To her horror, she noticed that, the, that her ugly bags were still right up front on the platform for the world to see. She rushed over to conceal them, but to no avail. They just kept working their way to the front, glancing around, hoping the stress the porter was approaching. With a sympathetic smile and kindness eyes she'd ever seen. Yes, ma'am. Can I take the bag and dispose of it? She stood there standing, staring, thinking how much she loved that bag, so accustomed to it that she could no longer remember life without it, still recalling the peaceful faces of those who had left, her, left their baggage relieved 
that he only questioned, only requested one bag. She somehow found the strength. With trembling hands, she gave her bag to the porter. Pulling out of the station, as she glanced back at the bag, it looked so so shabby and ordinary that she wondered what will the fuss what was the fuss about. She settled in with her lighter load and enjoyed the rhythm of the ride. And so her journey went. Station after station, bag after bag, the porter would always make his request. Sometimes she would refuse, choosing instead to struggle but to, to struggle back onto the train, clutching her bag. But it always sat there, accusing her until she came to hate that bag. It would never take many, it would never take many station stops after the porter's request until she would leave it behind with a sigh and a smile. From large and ugly to small and seemingly harmless, one by one the baggage was surrendered to the patient porter until she indeed traveled light. As she stood one day on the platform glancing down, she couldn't believe her eyes. All around her were bags and they had her name on them. At first she was filled with dread thinking she had reclaimed her old baggage. But then she realized that she didn't recognize these bags. She didn't know what they contained. Curiously, she picked up one, only to find it as light as a feather. And she wondered how long she had been carrying these bags without noticing. With the anticipation of opening a gift, she carefully opened the cases and sat there with tears of joy streaming down her face, for within the bags were the blessings of obedience. One bag was filled with joy, another with peace, purpose, self-respect, faithfulness, love, bag after bag. Flung open the gifts until kneeling there on the platform, she worshipped God in joyous abandonment. She worshipped as, a, she worshiped as only a woman whose heart has been set free for its heavenly destiny can worship. Feeling a touch as soft as a lamb upon her shoulder, she turned her face up and expecting to look up to the gentle eyes of her friend, the porter, but instead found herself alone, or was she? Soaring in the brightness blue sky she had ever, she had ever seen was a single majestic eagle. There stands another at the depot with the weight of their baggage all around her. As the glorious train pulls into the station, she knows that down the rail, she too will be asked to surrender her bags, for she heard about the porter. Without much concern, she decides to wait on the train that will never ask for surrendered baggage. Do you know the porter? If so, what baggage is he waiting patiently for you to surrender? If you do not know him, the train is about to depart. Will you join me on the most exciting journey you will ever find the courage to embark on? For I am the pitiful girl standing on the platform who has come to trust the faithful porter. Do you need a miracle? Look up. You just may be the unexpected. God bless the travelers. Look at this. What I wrote making me cry. Big grief. <laughs> of course, I weep, you know. Um, I will never, ever forget the day I wrote that. Um, the Spirit has never come so powerfully upon me to cause me to write. And I was, we were living over in Brown County, and I was driving over to the church to work on the church before it opened, and it just hit me. And I kept, it was before the smartphones. So I was digging in my car, and I was finding any and everything to write on. And I would write a while, and I'd think I was through, and I'd drive a little ways, and then I'd be diving off the road, and I would write some more. And it was just consuming me. I just wrote it like that. And then when I got through, I was just sitting there and I looked up and I'm like, okay, am I done, Lord? Because I'm you know, pulling on and off the road. And there was an eagle <laughs> soaring in the sky. So that's how it made its way into that. So that's the story behind the story. Takeaway. Truth is the character of Jesus Christ manifested to us through the Holy Spirit so that we can understand the importance of accepting his truth alone. Then and only then can we walk through this life as believers, separating is absolute truth from the world's lies. Jesus is truth. 
What is truth? The truth is that, the, in the, that in light of these truths, he is worthy of our complete devotion, our trust, and our lives. Once we fully embrace truth in all his glory, our journey is fulfilling and purpose-filled all the way home. Truth. I know we're out of time, but close. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the beautiful children in the, in the other rooms over and the leaders leading them and their patience with us, Lord. And thank you for the word truth, Lord. I look forward to, 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 de- to just diving in, head into obedience next week, Lord. Thank you so much. Bless everyone here tonight. Give them double blessings throughout this week, Father. Thank you, Lord, for their love and for the love that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen.